John Agard was born in Georgetown, which is the capital of what we now know as Guyana. When he lived there, it was British Guiana because it was in fact a British colony. So it was ruled by the British and it didn't achieve independence until 1966. For a full 200 years, it was in fact British. And if you can look at this map for a second, you'll see the scale of the British Empire. Still, I find this incredible when I look at maps like this. Um, British Guiana, as it was before it achieved independence, is down in the bottom left-hand corner there. It's part of South America. It's now its own sovereign state, of course, but it's interesting that it's the only South American nation in which English is still the official language. Most of the Guyanese population don't speak standard English, though. They speak Guyanese Creole, which is an English-based Creole language. It has Dutch and Caribbean influences, and you'll hear Agard using it in the poem. This Creole language is very important to the meaning of the poem, in fact. A Creole, by the way, is a language that originated from a mixture of two or more languages. Finally, by way of context, it's important to know that John Agard's mother was Portuguese and his father Afro-Guyanese. When he moved from Guyana to London in 1977, he became sick and tired of being referred to as half-caste. He found it an ignorant, offensive term, and you will hear why when I share the poem with you now. It's actually John Agard's voice you'll hear, him reading his own poem. He wrote this poem very much to be performed. There's a little bit of audience noise, even audience participation at some point. So if you want a cleaner recording, go to BBC Bite Size because there's another one there. Anyway, here's Agard and Half Cast. Standing on one leg, I'm half cast. Explain yourself what you mean when you say half cast. You mean when Picasso mix red and green is a half cast canvas. Explain yourself what you mean when you say half cast. You mean when light and shadow mix in the sky is a half cast weather. In that case, England weather nearly always half cast. Some of them clouds half cast, till them overcast. So spiteful, them don't want the sun to pass a rust. Explain yourself what you mean when you say half cast. You mean when Tchaikovsky sit down at the piano and mix a black key with a white key is a half cast symphony. You mean when Tchaikovsky sit down at the piano and mix a black key with a white key is a half cast symphony. Explain yourself what you mean. I'm listening to you with the keen half of my ear and looking at you with the keen half of my eye and I'm sure you'll understand why I offer half a hand when I'm introduced to you and when I sleep at night I close half a eye consequently I dream half a dream and when moon begin to glow I half cast human being cast half a shadow but come back tomorrow with the whole of your eye and the whole of your ear and the whole of your mind. And I'll tell you the other half of my story. These are the opening lines of the poem and you can see at a glance that it's written in free verse. All of the lines are short like this, unusually short, perhaps allowing Agard to really drill home his point with short, emphatic lines. There's no conventional punctuation in the poem either, no full stops, no commas, just the occasional dash or forward slash. Perhaps this is because the poem was written for performance, 
and Agard himself said that he wanted the speaker, the reader of the poem, to bring his own rhythm to it, to breathe the poem through his own breath, is the way that Agard put it. So that's quite a democratic idea of thinking about poetry, really. He wants readers of this poem to, to really own it. Another unconventional feature of the poem is its spelling. Have a look at the word yourself, for example. That's what we call phonetic spelling. So the word is spelt as it sounds. And Agard uses phonetic spelling so that this poem has to be read in the Guyanese Creole that he speaks. He's proud of his roots, he's proud of his language, and the poem celebrates that by recreating that language. The dialect also reminds us that the speaker is outside of mainstream English culture and we learn from this poem what that can feel like. I've said this poem is written in free verse so there's no formal rhyme scheme but there are rhymes within it as we'll see when we go through in more detail and these rhymes give it an energy, a musical quality, a rhythm which again captures the Creole dialect. Here are some of those key ideas, key terms that I've just used. You might want to make a note of them in relation to structure. I've already established then that this poem is written in the first person. It's Agard's own voice we're hearing and that idea of voice is really important because he's celebrating his language, he's celebrating his identity as an immigrant of mixed race. Interestingly though, he's talking to another person specifically because he repeats throughout the poem, and actually this is what structures the poem as well, he repeats explain yourself. So prior to the poem we get the impression that he's been offended just one too many times by somebody using that term half caste and he's decided to say what he thinks about it. So the poem is almost a rant, really. So these are the opening three lines of the poem. It's the only stanza on its own. There's a gap after these three lines and then we get the long stanza, rather like a rant, as I said earlier. And we have an image of the poet standing on one leg because he's half cast. These lines are obviously dripping in irony and immediately we get the sense that this idea of being half anything is completely ridiculous. Clearly, Agard has two perfectly good legs, just like people who aren't mixed race. So it begins with a joke. The poem continues, explain yourself what you mean when you say half caste. This phrase, explain yourself what you mean, is repeated four times in the poem. The repeated phrase serves two purposes. First of all, it allows Agard to provide a clear structure. So whenever this phrase, explain yourself what you mean, appears, there's a shift and Agard moves on to the next of a series of comparisons which form the basis for this poem. Also, explain yourself, it's a command, it's a challenge and the repetition of the phrase gives the poem much of its robust, forceful, almost angry tone. Explain yourself. Here's the first of that series of comparisons that I mentioned earlier. And Agard is saying that, do we call Picasso's paintings half cast because they mixed red and green? So he's highlighting again the absurdity of this idea of something being half, not complete, if it's a mix of things. And how dull, how boring would Picasso's paintings be if they were just one colour? So the references to art, which there are more of later in the poem, they're quite deliberate. Mixture is beautiful. Here's an example of the internal rhyming that I mentioned earlier as well. You mean red and green. It's musical, it's lively, it's good to listen to. We get now the first repetition of explain yourself what you mean when you say half cast and that signals a move to the next comparison in the poem. 
In this section of the poem, Agard is really mocking the English weather. And he's also saying that if the sky isn't completely blue, if it's a mixture of clouds and sun, then do we call it half cast weather? Notice the play on the word overcast as well there. Reference, of course, to cloudy days. Arras is my arse in Agard's Creole. And you can hear his exasperation there. The explain yourself command following again, gathering force and rhetorical power every time we hear it. This section might remind you of a Paul McCartney song, Ebony and Ivory. Um, but again, it's a reference to the art world, this time the world of music and Agard having fun with this idea of a symphony being a half cast symphony if it uses white and black notes on the piano. Clearly preposterous idea. That's the end of the comparisons, which as I say, are taken from the art world for a reason, I think. Art is beautiful, colourful. But the poem shifts slightly now and the tone becomes more challenging, more bitter and the speaker now talks directly to this person who's offended him and says that he will engage with him simply with half of his body. With some sarcasm he's saying if I'm half cast, if I'm only half a person, then obviously I can only listen to you with half of my ear, look at you with half an eye, offer you half a hand to shake. The repetition of half, half, half is really powerful at this point in the poem. Continuing with this theme, he says sarcastically that when he sleeps he must only half dream. Notice though that the imagery in the stanza is quite sinister. He talks about the glow of the moon and finishes the section with I half cast human being cast half a shadow and he's perhaps suggesting there that that's how he's perceived by white English people as something sinister, almost evil, associated with the shadows. This is clearly something he resents strongly and that resentment and anger reaches a climax in the next and final phase of the poem. Having ridiculed the way the bigoted person that he's addressing thinks, he now commands that he returns tomorrow, this listener, with the whole of his mind. And here's the irony of the poem, that actually, if anybody's only thinking with half a mind, if anybody's just half a person, it's a racist. The tone is almost dismissive. Come back tomorrow when you're worth talking to, is the implication. And look at the repetition of whole, whole, whole there. Agard is, of course, whole. He's more complete than any bigot. And he's asserting his identity very strongly at this stage of the poem. And here are the final lines. And I will tell you the other half of my story. So there's more we should know. Agard is saying there's more we should know about him, but we can't know it. We can't understand his story until we have open minds, until we are free from prejudice, which stops us seeing clearly with both of our eyes and understanding completely with the whole of our minds. This poem's at times playful, at times angry, and actually you can emphasise the one tone or the other by the way that you read it, and Agard himself has done that in performance, read it different ways. But the theme is a very serious one. It's a poem about prejudice, as we've seen, and the conflict that that causes. Agard's offered a solution to the conflict in this poem, though. He's saying that bigots who use terms like half-caste in that dismissive way, if they open their minds, then that would be a resolution to conflict. And the poem ends with an invitation, or more a command, 
to the listener to return tomorrow with a whole mind, not a shrunken one, as illustrated on this graphic here, which I think reinforces the theme of the poem quite nicely, really. It's also a poem that celebrates through its language and its assertive energy, identity. Agard is proud of his roots, clearly proud of his cultural identity, and we hear that in the poem. That's why he uses his own language, his rich Guyanese Creole, which he's proud of, which is part of who he is, and which is a language itself that combines other languages. So a rich mix, as interesting and colourful as a Tchaikovsky symphony or a Picasso painting. <laughs>